So good morning, everybody, and you are very welcome to this Love Irish Food event entitled What Comes Next? Rebuilding from COVID-19 and Brexit. My name is Alison Kauser, and I'm your host for the event this morning. Uh, we're delighted so many of you have joined us, and we're looking forward to an interactive hour or so. Uh, we have a, a lineup of some great speakers, and we're hoping for some questions and comments from, from yourselves. Um, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please get involved. We'd love to hear from you. Um, the hashtag for the event today is hashtag love Irish food. Um, so again, if you're on social media, please, please give it a mention. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, as I say, we have a lineup of a number of great speakers today um, on the theme. Uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We're hoping for about an hour of the, the full event, so uh, I, won't, I won't delay. And I'll introduce our first speaker for this morning. Um, it is Antonis, the Minister for Trade, Enterprise and Employment, Leo Varadkar. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you to Kieran, to Donald and to Alison for inviting me to be part of today's webinar. The role of Love Irish Food has never been more relevant in promoting locally produced food and drink brands than it is today. Despite the extraordinary challenges of the past year, the agri-food sector has demonstrated great resilience. The pandemic initially placed pressure on our food supply chains with effects across farm labour, processing, transport and logistics, as well as massive shifts in demand. The food service industry in Ireland and Europe experienced near collapse in demand due to the forced closure of the hospitality sector. And yet at the same time, Irish food retail demand increased to see year-on-year -year growth of almost 20%, with Irish shoppers spending over a billion on groceries in 2020, 162 million more than in 2019. The value of our food exports in 2020 was down only 3% compared to 2019. And that's an impressive achievement when you consider the year that it was with COVID and Brexit. Last week's economic figures from the CSO demonstrated how Ireland in many ways two economies. On the one hand, we have a booming traded and export sector that helped Ireland become one of the few countries in the world to record growth in 2020. On the other hand, we have the domestic economy that contracted by 5% due to the pandemic. I believe we're lucky to have successful companies operating in pharma, digital, medtech, and the agri-food sectors. Their success means we can, we can continue to afford to fund the pandemic unemployment payments, the wage subsidy schemes, as well as the extra investment we need in healthcare, housing, and education. But it also highlights the extent to which the domestic economy is really hurting, and why we must do everything in our power to reinvigorate it in the coming months. As you all know, the food and drink sector is Ireland's most important indigenous exporting industry. 137,000 farms produce over 8 billion in output. We have 770,000 hectares of forest and over 2,000 fishing vessels and aquaculture sites. The agri-food supply chain stretches from rural and coastal areas all across Ireland to the UK, Europe, and further to markets in the Americas, Asia, and Africa. The sector also makes a really significant contribution to national employment, employing over 164,000 people, or 7% of employment in 2019. And outside the greater Dublin area, it provides between 10 and 14% of all employment. The agri-food sector has evolved to meet the needs of its customers, domestically and internationally. And now as we move into the second quarter of 2021, that adaptability is even more important. Ireland has a strong international reputation as a supplier of safe, nutritious and sustainably produced food. International consumers seek out our food and beverage products in what is a very competitive international market. We should be proud of this and work to enhance that reputation for the benefit of farmers, fishermen and other producers. You can be sure that the government will play its part in the coming months to help the sector to plan for the future. And since the onset of the pandemic, we've introduced a range of grants, subsidies and loan schemes, including the COVID-19 Working Capital Loan and also the COVID-19 Credit Guarantee Scheme. Back in February, Minister McConnell and I made the first call for the Capital Investment Scheme for the processing and marketing of agricultural products. In recognition of the sector's unique exposure to the impact of Brexit, this fund will put €100 million Euros worth of investment into helping the sector to adapt, diversify and innovate, essentially to make new products and tap new markets. There's a 10 million euro fund available since 2018 for the prepared consumer food sector, 
and this fund is in place to help with the purchase of specialist equipment, providing companies with the opportunity to pilot equipment, to scale up production, and to enable the adoption of novel technologies to meet evolving consumer demands and expectations. Companies can also avail of the specialist knowledge and expertise of Chaga staff in piloting and developing new food products. There's also the Leader Food Initiative, which continues to support new and existing artisan micro and small food beverage producers to overcome emerging challenges through investment in areas like market development, competitiveness and innovation. And a new call for proposals under this scheme will take place later this year. As you know, Love Irish Food encourages consumers to make informed choices about buying food and drinks made in Ireland, to create the realisation that every time a consumer makes a conscious decision to purchase the product, this is good for local employment and local businesses all over Ireland as well. Love Irish Food plays a central role in driving home these messages, because ultimately it's the purchasing decision of consumers that matter most. Local food isn't just produced locally, but also more sustainably. And consumers and businesses are now more interested in environmental sustainability than before when choosing what to buy. I believe we've, we've an advantage in Ireland with the Origin and Green program. And we need to build on this to provide proof of how we're continuously improving our environmental performance. Our success depends on our ability to develop and sustainably grow in areas where we have real and tangible competitive advantages. Our small food and drink business sector is one such area. So I'd like to express once again my admiration for the performance of our Irish food and drink sector and everyone involved in it. The government and our state agencies will continue to back you in the period ahead. It will be difficult, but there are grounds for optimism. More than half a million vaccines have been administered, and this will ramp up across April and May. And the really positive news is that the vaccines work and are close to 100% effective when it comes to avoiding hospitalizations, severe illness and death. Things are gonna look a lot better in a few months time. So I know it's been a really difficult start to this year, but I'm increasingly optimistic about the year ahead. So that's it for me. I really hope you have a productive and enjoyable webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thonish, and thank you for those words of support for Love Irish Food and, and for the Irish food industry. Uh, and also re reiterating just how important uh, the, the industry is to this country. Uh, I'm now going to have a, a discussion with uh, Kieran Rumley of Love Irish Food. Kieran, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks indeed, Alison. Pleasure. Kieran, I suppose for anybody listening today or watching today who's not hugely familiar with Love Irish Food and, 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 and what you do, um, can you give us a little bit of background on the organisation? Surely. Uh, Love Irish Food was set up just over 10 years ago about now. And today we have about 60 companies with multiples of brands and anything extending from multinational to through to SMEs. But they all share one very strong component, which is that their products are produced exclusively um, in Ireland um, and use local sourcing where that's available. And that's a hugely important criteria for, for our members. Um, and that these members essentially are a fundamental plank um, for the growth of the future of the economy. Uh, Love Irish Food has an enormously strong message on sustainability. It's about local employment, local sourcing, keeping, keeping local communities together, essentially. And, 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 and the Thonish that has mentioned that really in terms of the, the role that those companies are going to play in rebuilding the economy post-COVID and, and Brexit? Yes, uh, and that's that's vitally important. I mean, we've seen from Brexit um, that we need to build a more independent food supply in that we, even though as a food nation, we, uh, we export 8 billion euros worth of food and drink annually. Uh, um, uh, sorry, if we import 8 billion worth of food and drink annually, 4 billion alone coming from the UK. And we've seen through uh, Brexit that customs declarations, for example, are, are adding an enormous complexity to trading, moving from about 1.6 million um, per annum to about 20 million per annum in, in terms of the declarations. And one of the things that comes out strongly is that local companies um, can show as suppliers 
how adaptable they are and their ability to supply alternatives to imported produce. And I think if there's any light, you know, uh, blue sky with regard to Brexit, it's that component itself. Um, so, so being a member of, of Love Irish Food for any food brands that are thinking of getting involved out there, what, what does it involve? Well, it, 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 very simply that you produce locally, you source locally, and that we encourage people, you know, with an 88% recognition factor uh, of the Love Irish Food uh, logo, that essentially that people use it. There's a, there's a huge support out there for buying local, supporting local, and that's the thing that's going to drive future economic growth. We, for example, to our members, have, have a very big uh, social engagement following of 65,000 on Facebook alone with, with a, a really active weekly engagement. It's not just a one-off thing, it, it's continual. And we support through national advertising, um, a, a activation at Bloom, for example, knowledge sharing, that knowledge sharing is very relevant at the moment with COVID and Brexit updates that are going out uh, on a weekly basis to our members, podcasts um, uh, on, 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 you know, enormously important items of, of, of messaging to the public. It could be anything from sustainability through to um, investment. Um, we have a, a very significant, for example, engagement with PwC. We're undertaking a, a, a significant barometer uh, research project at the moment with them at, at, at right now. But essentially, we have one big new initiative coming through in this year, and that's a new retailer partnership to support Love Irish Food producer members. It's the one big gap in our communications process at the moment that involves when the shopper goes into store that they that they get facilitated with a message that allows them to be more a bit more enlightened on what products are actually produced here uh, as they reach out to put a product into their basket. Um, and so we want to fill that gap with a, a producer uh, to our producer members essentially uh, and facilitate a greater engagement with with retailers and that, 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 that that's, a, that's a very positive new initiative um kieran i mean uh, i suppose as as east coast at east coast bakehouse we are very proud members of love irish food and certainly would attest to the huge benefits that we've seen throughout uh, our, our membership um anybody interested in getting involved what should they do do they contact you by email or, or what's the... yes if, if anybody wants to you know even discuss preliminary basis of, of, of what Love Irish Food is about and how it can help them, we'd ask them to reach out to me at kieran.romley at loveirishfood.ie and I'd be delighted to, to, um, to, to engage with them on it. And, and obviously the website, the, the uh, Love Irish Love Irish Food. Food.ie will actually give people a very good overview of what we do, how we do it, and the, the frequency of which we, we engage with, with, our, with our members. Okay, thank you very much, Kieran. I think that's given us a, a, a lot more information on what Love, Love Irish Food is about. And again, anybody interested in joining, please do get in touch. Um, so I'd like to move on to our next speaker now this morning, uh, a man who many of you will be familiar with in the grocery trade. Um, it's Mr. Joe Manning, who is the Commercial Director of Tesco Ireland. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Alison, and uh, good morning all. And, um, and thank you to Kieran and Donald for the opportunity to talk to all the Love Irish Food members this morning. Um, Love Irish Food is an organisation which I know very well. Um, back in 2009, when Love Irish Food was um, founded, um, I was working with Cadbury Ireland, and Cadbury Ireland was a very important, I suppose, founding partner uh, within the Love Irish Food membership. So it's, it's an organisation I'm, I'm very familiar with. I'm very familiar with the goal of Love Irish Food, which is to help shoppers make informed choices. So when Love Irish Food came about back in 2009, we know that um, those were, were times of, of, of deep economic uncertainty. Uh, and that, I suppose, uncertainty uh, is there again today. So I think the role that Love Irish Food will play in the coming years is equally important as when it was founded back in 2009, because there's no doubt that the pandemic has caused a lot of uncertainty within the industry and I suppose within the wider Irish economy. And there's certainly a role for Love Irish Food to play there. And as I said, uh, an organisation I'm well familiar with from my days in Cadbury Ireland uh, back in 2009. So from a Tesco point of view, Love Irish Food brings real clarity to that choice at the shelf edge. And it's really important for shoppers to, to make that informed decision with regards to the origins of a product. Um, 
So I suppose my objective over the next few slides, over the next 10 minutes or so, is hopefully to help the Love Irish Food members understand Tesco a little bit more, because um, it's fair to say that Tesco is often a little bit misunderstood. Um, so if we move on, um, many of you will be well aware of, of the Tesco organisation. Um, we're 24 years uh, in Ireland now, 151 stores, 13,000 colleagues. So no surprises there. You're all very familiar with that phase of Tesco. I think what's probably less well known is that Tesco is the largest purchaser of Irish food and drink in the world. So 1.6 billion of purchases annually by Tesco Group. Uh, huge amounts, obviously, in Ireland. Then it's huge amounts as well going into the UK in particular and also into the wider European business. I think the other piece maybe that's not always as well known is that we actually do business with over 480 Irish suppliers in Ireland, and that supports 40,000 jobs uh, across the country, both directly and indirectly. And a further point to note is that we were recently, in fact, last week, um, we were announced as uh, a top 20 great place to work. So our colleagues really reflect, uh, I suppose, the true nature, the true culture within the Tesco business. Uh, and we were very proud that for the uh, third year in a row, um, we were a great place to work um, as voted for by our colleagues. So uh, I don't want this to, to turn into a party political broadcast on behalf of Tesco, obviously, uh, but what I would do want to do in, in giving the Love Irish Food members a greater understanding of Tesco, I do want to share some, uh, some facts with regards to I suppose, the, um, the work we do with regards to having a positive impact within the communities in which we work, which we serve, in which we live. Um, so just uh, maybe a few to throw out there that over the last five years, Tempest Street has been our, 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 our charity partner of the year. And over those five years, we've worked with our colleagues to raise five million euros for Tempest. Uh, over the last six years, we've supported 20,000 community projects through the Tesco Community Fund. And over the last 12 months, we've donated a million euros um, for community supports during COVID. And as a founding partner of Food Cloud, we worked with Food Cloud uh, over, the, last, uh, over uh, the last six years since Food Cloud uh, came into being to redistribute 12 million meals. So I think so, those are some of the positive impacts which we have within our community. And I think that very much chimes to the, um, I suppose, the values and the ethos of Love Irish Food with regards to being a positive impact on the communities within, within which the Love Irish Food members uh, work. I may be bringing it a little bit closer to today's subject uh, matter. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Tesco Ireland, 24 years doing business in Ireland. And many of the suppliers that we've had since day one, they continue to be key partners to us to this very day because we believe in long-term partnerships. We believe long-term partnerships are what pay off from a Tesco point of view and from a supplier partner point of view. And I think we've seen that over the last 12 months in particular. So throughout the pandemic, what we've seen is an extremely agile and resilient Irish supply base, a very strong supply chain. Um, and we, we, we all remember the uncertain times 12 months ago um, when the, the, the then T-ship, Leo Radker, from whom we heard uh, from earlier, when he made those announcements with regards to the school closures. And we recall the, the, the run on the supermarket shelves on that Thursday, the 12th of March last year. Very uncertain time. Um, but what really stood to us as a business and stood to all retail in Ireland, to be fair, was the resilience, the agility of the Irish supply base. And we know when we benchmark across other European markets, that, that resilience, that agility really came to the fore and really stood the, 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 the test. And it was a significant test at the time. So maybe a, a little bit of a look forward. Uh, and I know, like myself, we're all looking forward to better times ahead. I think we're all pretty confident that we're closer to the end of the pandemic than we are to the start of the pandemic. Um, and I think what we'll all expect to see is the unwinding of certain COVID behaviours as we see the unwinding of those restrictions. So there's no doubt that the level of channel switch that we've seen over the last 12 months will revert um, as those restrictions ease and the food service channel in particular uh, comes back into, in, into being. So we will see the reversal of that channel switch and some of those consumer behaviours. But I don't think we we'll see any reversal of though is the, the more conscientious um, consumption and the more thoughtful purchase behaviour that we've seen over the last 12 months. And I know we'll hear from David Berry from Cantor a little bit later, and David will talk about, I suppose, the, the, the robust performance from Irish brands in particular over the last 12 months. And I think that's very much driven by the thoughtful consumption and this thoughtful purchase behaviour we've seen over the last 12 months. But I don't think we'll see any reversal on either, is um, the move towards health, scratch cooking, home baking. Um, and also, I think a key is we won't see the unwinding of the move to online shopping. So online shopping was relatively undeveloped uh, in Ireland, um, and we've seen a huge acceleration over the last 12 months. We ourselves have seen our online business double over the last 12 months. I suppose our expectation is that a lot of shoppers, having tried online, uh, have found the, the experience very positive and will continue to shop online, and that the online channel will continue to grow in, into the future. 
And I think the other thing as we look forward to 2021 is the obvious elephant in the room is Brexit. And there's no doubt about it, Brexit has caused challenges to the, food chain, uh, to the supply chain. Um, and the reason for that's very simple. We've gone from having the most efficient supply chain as an island nation that you could possibly have, to one which now has customs checks and friction and delays and admin burden within it. Now, there's no doubt that things have settled down over the last number of months, but by the same token, you know, those friction costs and th that admin burden, those time delays, they're not going to go away. They're part and parcel of the new supply chain for the island of Ireland. And um, so there's no doubt within that, uh, there, are, there are opportunities for our suppliers um, to, to be on a more level footing, uh, because obviously they won't uh, be, um, uh, I suppose, they won't have the burden of some of those friction costs. They won't have the burden of some of that time loss um, during the various checks at port. So whilst the situation has greatly improved and settled down over the last number of months, and um, that's going to continue to be a feature of doing business from a supply chain point of view onto the island of Ireland. So um, I think uh, move, moving a little bit closer again to home with regards to the opportunity to, to, to partner with Tesco, 70% um, of the Love Irish Food members actually do business with Tesco currently. And as I mentioned earlier, Tesco, uh, from a, a commercial point of view, from a business point of view, is all about long-term relationships with supplier partners. We don't believe in short-term tenders and we don't believe in trials. We believe in long-term partnerships, which is why many of our suppliers today are the same suppliers that uh, we did business with 24 years ago. I suppose we work best with um, suppliers who have a relentless passion for quality and they're focused on category growth, not category, um, ste not stealing from a competitor, I should say. Within the business, we have three groups of stakeholders. Um, first group of stakeholders we have is our colleagues. And as I mentioned earlier, we were delighted um, that our colleagues have fed back to us that we're a great place to work for the third year in a row. And um, so we look for feedback from our colleagues throughout the year. The second group of stakeholders we have is our customers, obviously. And we continuously look for feedback from our customers in order to ensure that we're servicing, servicing them a little better every day. And that's our key mission, our key purpose, and our key vision for the business in Ireland. But the third group of stakeholders that we look for feedback regularly is actually our supplier partners. And twice a year, we, um, we have a supplier viewpoint whereby suppliers can anonymously feedback on, on the quality of their relationship with Tesco. Delighted to say that we've had our year-end uh, supplier viewpoint feedback just a, a number of weeks back, um, and we achieved a score of 90%. So what I mean by that is a score of 90%, whereby 90% of uh, our suppliers have a positive experience of their relationship with Tesco. And that's a business KPI. That's not just a commercial KPI. Our full business is KPI'd with ensuring that we have high quality, collaborative, part, open and transparent partnership relationships with our suppliers. So that 90% score was really positive and, and, and really reflects on the, the high level of collaboration we, we've had with our suppliers over the last 12 months in incredibly uncertain and challenging times. And I think the last piece that I'd mentioned with regards to our, our um, relationships with our suppliers is we've recently as well had the Advantage Group uh, feedback um, so the Advantage Group are an independent company um, that, um, I suppose, audit and interview and review um, all supplier uh, retailer relationships across the, um, across the island of Ireland. Um, and they recently fed back on their latest results. And um, so delighted to say that for the fourth year in a row, the Tesco Ireland is the number one retailer in Ireland to do business with, as fed back by our suppliers and as audited independently by the Advantage Group. So, as I say, I couldn't um, underemphasize or overemphasize um, the importance of our supplier relationships and having those collaborative supplier relationships. So, moving on then to my last slide, you'll be, you'll be glad to hear. Um, the one thing I would accept, uh, and I do hear it, um, and I hear it particularly when I go to various trade shows such as Bloom or such as Gloss, um, I do get feedback that it is really difficult to break into Tesco, and I fully accept that. Um, the reason it's very difficult to break into Tesco is we value long-term relationships. We don't believe in short-term tenders. We don't believe in trials. We believe in building strong and lasting collaborative relationships with our suppliers. However, the downside of that is it is difficult to break into Tesco. Um, so I think myself and Kieran and Donald, we're having conversations at the moment uh, to try and understand how we can demystify and that process for the Love Irish Food members um, and develop a relationship with Love Irish Food, which will help Love Irish Food members to get that access to the Tesco buyers, to get the opportunity to put their products in front of the Tesco buyers. So we would expect, um, I'm sure Kieran will update on that, maybe a little later in the year, but we certainly with positive intent, we're working with Love Irish Food at the moment in order to ensure that Love Irish Food members 
um, have um, that access to the Tesco buyers because we are committed to demystif demystifying the process for the Love Irish Food members. So that's it for myself. Um, I'm going to hand back to Alison now. I think there'll be an opportunity to send in questions uh, through the chat function. So please take that opportunity. And um, no doubt we'll talk to you a little bit later on. So back to Alison. Thanks very much. Yourself. Joe. Joe, thank you very much for the, the presentation. And I think um, we would all welcome that, that opportunity to see that the, the relationship with, with Tesco demystified. I mean, your, your, your support for the Irish food industry is outstanding. Um, and I think particularly you, you did mention that, that partnership approach between producers and retailers um, throughout the COVID crisis, particularly and Brexit, which, uh, which is ultimately going to, we hope, deliver a more prosperous future for us all. But um, great to see that the level of cooperation, uh, as I say, between producers and, and Tesco over the years. And, and I know we all hope that will, will continue. So thank you for your presentation. We're going to move on now to our next presenter. Um, our next presenter this morning is Jim Power, um, who is an economist. His views are widely sought across many organizations and, and the media in this country. Uh, he's also a director of Love Irish Food, and, and clearly um, he's, he's with us in terms of um, understanding a lot about the Irish food industry and Irish food brands. And we look forward to hearing uh, Jim. I'm going to hand over to you now, Jim Power. Um, good morning, Alison. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I will just share my screen here okay um there we are uh thank you very much for the introduction um welcome everybody to the love irish food webinar um i'm not going to detain you too long i just want to talk a little bit around some of the issues in the irish food sector and i suppose more importantly some of the challenges and the potential opportunities ahead um just to summarize the I suppose contribution of the agri-food sector um, is interesting. Back in 2008, 2009, um, as the economy crashed, um, I think there was a strong sense about the place that the agri-food sector and its contribution, particularly its contribution to regional economic activity, had been forgotten during the Celtic Tiger years. Um, it had become very unsexy and there was a lot of other industries and sectors that were really top of the pile in terms of media coverage, et cetera. But I think after 2008, 2009, there was a very strong realization that actually the food sector could and would play a significant role in rebuilding the Irish economy and Irish society, which it actually did. Um, looking at the latest statistics on the sector in 2020, according to CSO data, slightly different than Borbia data, but slightly, we're looking at food, live animal and beverage exports of around 13 billion. OK, so a significant um, and the biggest indigenous export sector of the economy. Um, at the final in the final quarter of 2020, uh, we had over 60,000 people employed directly in food and beverage manufacturing. We had another 99,900 people involved in animal and crop production. So farmers mainly there. So you're talking about direct employment of over 160,000 people. And of course, then the indirect economic and employment impact is very, very significant. But the direct contribution is equivalent to roughly 7% of total employment. But it is a high value added employment in the sense that it is all, all very firmly rooted in the domestic economy and the community. Um, and I think that is really one of the selling points for the agri-food sector. You know, its contribution at a national level is very strong, but I think it's local economic and social contribution and the contribution it makes to the sustainability of local economies and local communities is really, really important. And at an overall aggregate level, it accounts for, <clears throat> excuse me, around 6.7% of real or modified economic activity in the economy. Um, looking at where we are at the moment as an economy, um, in the last 12 months, COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact on all aspects of our life, but particularly um, at the economic level. You know, we now have either between being on the live register and the pandemic unemployment payment, we have just over 650,000 people in receipt of state aid in the labor market. 
Um, and that would be equivalent to around 29% of the workforce we had in the overall economy in 2019. So it's been a dramatic impact on uh, the labor market in the economy. But as the Tanish has said earlier, it is very much a story of two different economies. And at a, a high level, multinational corporations, their output last year grew by about 18.5%. But the output from non-multinational or indigenous Irish companies actually fell by around 9.5%. So the, if, if sectors like foreign direct investment, professional services, financial services, um, performed very strongly last year. But then you look at the sectors that were really hit, non-essential retail, the tourism sector, food services, arts and entertainment, you know, all of the sectors that were subject to the significant restrictions that have been placed over the last 12 months. And the impact of all of that, I believe, um, has been disproportionately um, apportioned to SMEs and also to rural economic activity. They have been hit much, much harder than other sectors, other parts of the economy. Um, as the Tarnish also said, the retail sales of food and beverage was very strong last year. But of course, the food service activity virtually died as that sector was forced to shut down. Uh, Brexit, also a challenge. Thankfully, on the 31st of December, we did avoid the hard Brexit and a WTO trading environment. However, uh, there is no doubt about it, and Joe alluded in the last presentation, you know, supply chain issues are definitely resulting from Brexit. It is complicating and it is leading to price rise in some places. So I suppose the opportunity here for the domestic sector, and this is one of the few opportunities that Brexit actually does present for the Irish economy, is the notion of import substitution. If stuff we currently import directly from or through the UK is becoming more expensive or more difficult to source, we should learn, certainly examine carefully the potential for import substitution to address those supply difficulties. Another feature is that the food price inflation environment, and I've since I joined um, Love Irish Food upon its foundation back in 2009, um, I have constantly um, hammered on this point about the significant food price compression that we see across the economy. And between 2010 and 2020, average food prices fell by 9.2% at the retail level. So that just is an indication of the very significant level of competition in the retail food sector. Um, I believe, and I really do believe this, I believed it back in 2009, I believe it again now, that the agri-food sector can and will play a very significant role in rebuilding the economy post COVID-19, which is going to be really important for those parts of the economy, particularly rural and regional economies that were disproportionately hit by COVID. Um, and if we continue to see the same sort of growth in exports and employment that we've experienced over the last 10 years, there's no reason why by 2025 exports, could, exports couldn't hit close to 18 billion and we could see employment growth for around 15 billion in the sector. That's obviously not going to happen on its own. Um, we all have a key role to play in that. And I believe that Love Irish Food has a particularly key role to play here because um, I, I do believe that we focused attention 10 years ago on the importance of food brands and the importance of supporting food brands and that contributed to economic recovery. I believe also that it's really important to maintain the sort of shop local and support local business mantra that has become very popular since 2020, um, since the beginning of 2020. Um, a, lo a local um, food outlet of mine here in Dublin, uh, there's a sign outside the door which says, um, and I see it every morning on my walk, buy local or goodbye local. And that sort of sums up um, I think the sort of message we need to hammer out there that the real, real importance of supporting local businesses, and I would describe it as food nationalism. I think that ethos would work wonders for rural Ireland, and I've no doubt that you all will play a part in that, uh, but certainly as an organisation, Love Irish Food will try 
and promote that ethos as much as possible. So that's it. Um, a very quick run through the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I would be delighted to take any questions at the end of the session. So without further ado, I will hand back to Alison. Thanks very much, Jim. And uh, maybe that's the soundbite of, of the session here today. Buy local or goodbye local. Um, whoever whoever the retailer that put that up in the window, I think, had had a great insight to, to I suppose, what we're all hoping for, which is people continue to, to, to buy that the, the, their, their products locally post-COVID and, and obviously post uh, what we're seeing at the moment on Brexit. Uh, so thanks, Jim. And I look forward to, we, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you at, at, the, at the end of the session. Um, and I'd like now to introduce our next speaker, um, one of the things which as food producers we've been struggling with, I think, over the last year is, is that ability to, I suppose, understand the market a bit more, understand consumer motivations, consumer behavior, and, and what are they telling us? Um, so uh, I think uh, we would always look to, to Kantar as a, as a great source of information and data. Um, um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is David Berry, the uh, Managing Director of Kantar Ireland. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Alison, and good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. So what I'm going to be talking about this morning uh, is, is, is some of the big questions facing food brands and Irish food brands in particular, as we look beyond COVID and beyond Brexit and as we head into the what remains of 2021. Um, so what I wanted to start with was, that was actually just taking a bit of a step back, taking a bit of a look backwards to 2020 and, and, and just try and outline some of the big stories that came out. It was obviously a tumultuous year for the population in general, but also in, in particular um, for the retail food service sector, which saw dramatic changes uh, across the, the course of 2020 once, once we entered into lockdown. So five big key points that I'd pull out from this and, and call out this morning. So number one would be that we did see a dramatic shift in food and drink patterns. So with the closure of food service and the closure of the impulse sector, we saw a big transition into in-home. So as a, as a population, as consumers, we spent two billion more on food and drink in the home, um, a trend that is continuing into 2021 and will continue in for some time up until um, we have a return to the an open economy and an open food service sector. An important point to take out from this, and I've got a, another slide to come on this, is that Irish brands were definitely at the forefront of this. So we saw strong sales growth for Irish brands. So the, the thoughtful purchase decision that Joe talked about very, 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 very clearly um, is definitely on the mind of consumers. And that's something that I think is, is a job for us as an industry um, to really hammer home across the rest of 2021. We, there was a significant change in how we, in, in the approach we take to our shopping for food and groceries as well. So uh, we moved away from a little and often approach and made fewer but bigger trips. So we, we actually visited retail outlets 5% fewer occasions. Again, talking about the retail food, so the retail environment. But each shopping trip that we made was 20% larger. And certainly, I, th I think that's a trend that's going to continue as well. And, and it's a good point for brands. Brands are more likely to get picked up in those bigger shopping trips. So as the consumer moves towards that, it can create opportunities for brands. As our lives changed, um, our needs changed, and that led to a change in the leading categories as well within grocery. So we, we moved up until COVID and up until lockdown. Um, certainly some of, the, some of the trends that were top of mind for consumers would have been health and convenience. But we moved away from that and we spent more time in home and that changed what we were looking for. So home cooking and home baking came to the fore um, with pubs and restaurants being closed Then take home alcohol certainly saw significant growth and equally about personal hygiene as well was an underlying need for consumers. We also saw online really 2020 was a, was a year that online came to the fore. Um, so in previous years, it, it had reached a plateau really. So we saw 20% of people uh, making online shopping trips and that had been pretty consistent across a number of years previously, but actually that accelerated in 2020 um, and we saw that increase to 26%. And a big driver of that was different consumers starting to engage in online shopping. And I think that that's a very, very strong and clear trend that's gonna continue. 
So I mentioned about Irish brands coming to the forefront and, and probably if you were to take one thing from the presentation today, I, I think this slide would probably be it. Um, what we're looking at here is we, we analyzed the top 100 selling brands um, within Take Home Grocery. And we looked at them and we identified, right, which of those top 100 brands were Irish produced. And so there's a list of 44 brands within that top 100 that are Irish produced. And the numbers on the chart here are looking at the, what share of those top 100 brands, those 44 Irish produced brands capture. And you see back in 2016, it was 46%. And each year consistently since then, it has increased and it's reached a high point of 48% in 2020. If we look at the combined sales, it's above a billion euro in consumer spending on those Irish produced brands. It's grown by 18% compared to 2019. And actually looking back further, since 2016, it's actually grown by 29%. And both of those numbers would be ahead of, ahead of the non-Irish produced comp competition, if you like. So there is definitely an open door that Irish brands, locally produced brands are knocking on here. Um, and certainly something that we should take away and make sure that that message about buy local or good buy local um, really resonates and, and hits home with consumers loud and clear. The final point there was about, right, if that 48% share reaches 50%, then the sales growth of 53 million euro for Irish produced brands. So a positive story and certainly something that we, you know, we, sh we should be shouting about and really bring it to the forefront. So I'm just going to bring you through some of the big questions that, that we've identified facing uh, brands as we head into that post-COVID and post-Brexit era. And the first one is, when will we see a return to normal? And I think it's clear to say that restrictions will be with us for some time. Um, certainly as consumers and as shoppers, we are missing a lot of what we lost, but it isn't everything. So actually, if we think about it, what what is that return to normal going to look like? And I don't think it, I don't think offices are going to be open and everybody's going to be in offices five days a week. So that more time spent at home, more time spent locally, more time spent with family is something that's going to, is going to remain. And what will really trigger a change in our behavior will be what's in it for the consumer. So the, can we link changes that we want to see to our health, wealth or happiness? And that will then instigate the change. So the second question I wanted to touch on is about recessionary behavior. And we've, we've, we've heard a bit about 2008 and 2009 and what happened then. And I also wanted to reflect back on that. And I wanted just to pick out four, four key trends in consumption and, and, and food and drink consumption that occurred following the recession back in 2008. And three of these are about areas that increased. So up until the past recession, then snacking had actually been reducing. Uh, but we saw that turn around and snacking started to become more popular for consumers as a recession bit. And I, th I think that's people looking for small everyday treats. We also saw a rise in scratch cooking, certainly something that's been the case across 2020. Um, and we also saw a step change in lunch boxes. So people were more prepared about what they took out of home with us, whether it was taking out to the office or into work, then it was more likely to be a lunchbox occasion. So those three things were, were things that grow in importance. Um, and the fourth one was about health. So actually up until 2008, we'd seen a decade of um, more healthily, a decade of health driving consumption, but actually that turned on its head and we moved away from health a little bit. So uh, just a, a quick snapshot of, of whether we see these trends taking place so far um, in 2008. Well, certainly the first two, we have seen snacking return. We have seen an increase in scratch cooking. Um, we aren't heading out of the home as much, so lunch boxes as that have actually declined. And then the fourth one is about, we are seeing a more balance. So health is certainly strong in people's agenda, but I think it's a different type of health. Um, and the second one would be that treats are still more important. As we spend more time in the home, we're looking for those small treats. So um, it, it's a more balanced, okay, more balanced situation with regards health. So to summarize, should we be preparing for a recessionary behavior? Well, I think there is a feeling that the worst that, that the worst is yet to come. As government supports are potentially removed, then um, that we could see more impact of that. The impact of FMCG, ultimately, people still need to need to eat, they still need to drink. So the impact of FMCG as a, as a sector and 
food and drink is maybe less than it would be on other areas. Um, aside from the price deflation point, which, which I think Jim alluded to. And the final point would be that premium opportunities remain. So even if we, even if there is a recessionary mindset amongst consumers, it doesn't mean that the opportunity for premium has gone away. People are looking for those small luxuries. Um, so that there, there, there remains an appetite for premiumization. So a quick point on health as well. So what, what's the impact of the pandemic been on our health? And I think the, the main takeaway here for me is that it's a more balanced approach for health. So typically when we talk about people being healthy, we talk about eating healthily and looking to control the amount of bad foods they, they eat and consume more healthier foods. But actually it's a bit different this time. I think the impact of the pan pandemic is clear that it, it's a more all encompassing approach to health covering both physical and mental well-being. So the big takeaway from that for me, there's two points. One, in terms of physical well-being. So they, it, it's a watch out really around, could there be stronger government intervention? I think we've seen it in a couple of instances, such as the sugar tax and looking to bring in minimum unit pricing on alcohol. So there is there are signs that the government is taking more of a proactive approach in encouraging us to be healthy. And then on the mental well-being point, I, I think there's a point there about what role brands can play. So is there an opportunity to brands, brands to link into this growing concern about mental well-being, and whether it's partnerships with charities or, or really being active in the local community? I think there's definite opportunities for brands there. So to summarise that, the health has become more important and holistic. Uh, Self-care and wellness is rising in prominence. And so it isn't about shoppers looking for quick fixes. It's about those big lifestyle improvements that they're looking for. And there's definite and clear opportunity for brands to play a role in that. So the fourth big question, and one that's really, really relevant if we're thinking about Irish brands and locally produced brands is about should we be shouting about our sustainable credentials? And I think the answer to this would be a very, very clear yes. Um, the, what we're looking at here is the results of a global survey that we have conducted. It involves interviews of 84,000 consumers across a range of different countries and markets. And through a range of different questions, we've actually been able to create a shopper segmentation or a consumer segmentation based on people's attitudes towards sustainability. Um, and the key takeout here would be that currently we see that one in five people can be classified as eco-actives. Um, increase in importance compared to 2019, so it's increased from 16% of people up to 20%. And we've also seen a growth in eco considerates. So eco actives are those where um, sustainability and, and the economic impact of their choice really drives their decision making. Eco considerates, are, it, it's part of their decision making process and the eco dismisses obviously a reduction there in their importance. So what, what does that mean? And what is it that brands could be choosing to shout about? And, and we asked, we ask people about what does sustainability mean to them and what is it what are the issues that they consider when when they are considering taking action so the ones at the bottom here are the ones that are really really important so packaging really comes through as being a, a, a vital driver in the decision making process amongst those people who are more eco considerate and um, so packaging that can be recycled biodegradable or other material than plastic uh, we do see more local products come up there as well. So 23% of people saying that, that that's something that they look for. So definitely um, something that Irish brands can be looking to build on and, and use in their messaging with consumers. And more people can identify a brand that's doing do a good job. In 2019, only 12% of consumers could. So now it's up to 22%. So people are looking for brands that, that really make a difference here. And there's clear examples from a packaging point of view, the one that is really, really front of mind for consumers. We see it, whether it's about moving to recyclable plastic, reducing the amount of packaging used in, in the items, or even using towards an eco refill packs that we've got examples of as well. So different ways and means that brands can, can achieve that sustainable messaging. So the summary would be that the sustainable issues are gaining in importance, most certainly. Um, the most engaged shoppers really do make different purchase decisions than those who are less engaged. So um, re really having that front of mind and, and putting it in front of consumers is important. 
So the final um, question that I wanted to look at was what channels are going to drive our future growth? So where do we see um, the retail environment heading over the coming years? And certainly one that Joe touched on in his presentation, talking about the impact that they've seen in Tesco. Um, Tesco was certainly at the forefront of online delivery even before the COVID um, pandemic hit and before we moved into lockdown. But actually, what I, I just wanted to start and just touch on, I guess, the, the flexibility and responsiveness that the major retailers have shown across the course of 2020. So um, clearly a tumultuous year, lots of change, people looking for different ways to, to purchase and to engage with retailers. And I think the response has been very, very clear. And we can pick examples from across the big retailers, whether it's about um, introducing drive through grocery pickup destinations, partnerships um, that some of the retailers have launched into. So for example, Duns and, and Buy Me. Um, a really interesting one around Tesco with, with trialing drone delivery, um, which again is, is moving it on to the next level and, and to anticipate what comes next. Um, we've seen Lidl launch a Lidl Plus app, so a different way to engage with consumers, and then Aldi also teaming up with delivery. So, so certainly a lot of change going on within that retail environment and, and the way retailers look to engage with consumers. And I mentioned that 2020 was certainly the year that online grocery took off. Um, so up until that point, the proportion of Irish households availing of online grocery hadn't broken through the 20% barrier, but we've seen that smashed in 2020 up to 26%. Um, and even in December, in, in that all important Christmas month at the end of the year, um, a record 11% of Irish households shopped online in December. So it is, it is a trend that came through, came to the forefront post lockdown, has continued and has really been built up momentum. So something that we anticipate continuing. So I'll move on and just finish off with um, what we could, what we consider to be the big five key takeouts for Irish brands looking across the rest of this year and the post COVID and Brexit environment. So the first point for me would be really about amplifying those local credentials. I mentioned about it is an open door. Um, it is something that consumers are, are looking to engage with and are more aware of. Um, and they're backing that up with what they spend their money on as well. So there's clear opportunity there for, for locally produced brands to amplify that. We've seen a move towards a more holistic approach to health, uh, so less about physical well-being and more, and more encompassing both physical and mental well-being. So what can brands do to try and engage with consumers around that? We, we can now see that one in five consumers are classified as eco-actives, so sustainability is coming to the forefront, that more thoughtful purchase decision. And that can be a real advantage for local brands, certainly you know, less food miles and, and those angles can, can certainly be, create some opportunities for locally produced Irish brands. Uh, we've seen that online shopping took off in 2020. It is now embedded. We've seen different types of consumer, the more older consumer um, starting to avail of online shopping. So it is, it is a trend that's, that's now firmly established and is going to continue. Um, so then it becomes about, okay, how, how do you optimize your offer both in that digital environment for send a physical store. And the final point would be, even if we do enter into a recessionary environment, it still means there's an opportunity there for, for premium. So people looking for in-home treats, those small luxuries um, to replace that out of home expense with. So thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Um, I'm gonna hand back to Alison now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, great to see those insights and I suppose uh, great to get an opportunity to, to really begin to understand what consumers are thinking uh, in these really tumultuous times. Um, particularly good to see that uh, that, that take out of, of your, your advice to amplify local um, connections and local provenance, which is something that all of Irish food members clearly are in a position to do. And, and uh, I suppose it's understanding that that is something that consumers are seeking is, is really, really important for us. So thank you to all our speakers. We're gonna take a few questions now from the from the, the audience and I see we've, we've quite a number in. Um, I have a, a question here um, uh, coming in from James Keyes uh, for, um, for Joe actually in relation to Tesco. Uh, and I suppose it's a question uh, in relation to small businesses. What are the opportunities for small businesses with Tesco? And, and of the 480 suppliers you have, are, how many of these are small businesses? 
Uh, thanks, Alison. Thanks for the question, James. Um, the, the majority would be small. I don't have the exact number. I'd, I'd have to come back on that. But you can be certain the majority of the 480 would be considered smaller suppliers. Um, and we've arranged suppliers that will go from local supplying two or three stores all the way up to, to, to obviously the big multinationals, which would be Irish based uh, in Irish manufacturers. So there's, there's an array there. The majority are, are small. Um, but I suppose the opportunity is very much about the product itself and is there a customer need for the product? Um, because obviously space on shelf, even in, in our large stores, space on shelf is at a premium. Therefore, we will only introduce a new brand if it offers something different for the shopper. And um, so that's the key criteria on the opportunity for a smaller supplier is, does the brand offer something differentiated? Will it grow the category? Does it offer value to the customer? Um, and, you know, even if you take the, 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 I suppose we've spoken quite a bit, Jim has spoken about it, David's spoken about it, Kieran and myself have spoken about, there is a move more towards buying local, a uh, more conscientious purchase, and that does add value as well. So differentiation and, and, and creating customer demand by knowing the, uh, the product and uh, the target market would be the answer, Alison. Okay, thanks for that, Joe. Um, we have a question in for, our, for Jim. Uh, Jim, you, you did mention the, the potential impact on, on inflation during your presentation. So the question is, what in inflationary impact should Irish consumers expect over the coming years driven by both Brexit and COVID-19? Um, I there's, there's a big debate going on globally at the moment, Alison, about inflation generally, because there's so much monetary and fiscal stimulus in the system. Um, there is in this country, uh, in the last 13 months, we've increased savings by over 14 billion. There's 126 billion in personal savings in the system at the moment because people can't really spend. So there's going to be an influx of money back into the economy whenever people feel able to spend and confident and safe to go out and spend. So at a general level, there's going to be a bit of an inflationary impulse for a while, okay? Um, at the food level, I mean, I think there will be some inflation with individual items, um, but I do not envisage um, an overall surge in food price inflation. And in fact, I think that food price compression will remain um, the general feature of the landscape um, into the future. In other words, the trend of the last 10 years, I would expect to extrapolate forward. Uh, but accepting that there will be individual items, and we're already seeing it that have gone up in price because of supply chain difficulties with Brexit. But I, I do not envisage a surge in food price inflation. Okay, all right. Thanks Thanks for that, Jim. Um, we have a question in for David. Uh, and I suppose, David, it, it, it reflects, I suppose, the, the gains that have been made uh, by many brand owners. What should Love Irish Food brand owners focus on to ensure that they hold the upside, perhaps, that they've received during COVID-19 and Brexit? from that local shopping um, uh, impetus. Yeah, thanks, Alison. I think I think definitely getting that message across around the importance of buying local is, is really, really key. I mentioned about it being an open door. It is something consumers are looking for. So making that really, really apparent and clear to consumers is important. I think allied to that is a sustainability angle. So lower food miles, the local production, if improved packaging, things like that can certainly make a mark. That is something that's grown in importance. And I think we'll we'll come back to the four post COVID as well. And then the final one would really be about the, probably the most important moment is that moment of purchase when someone's in store, making their mind up, deciding exactly what it is that they buy. So that really making sure that your messaging and what you stand for as a brand comes through in store, I think is, is vital. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, David. We have a question in from Thomas Hubert, um, and it's for Joe, and it's, it's in relation to, to that, that double-edged sword of Brexit and, and COVID. So um, question for Joe, how, um, how do you, could you expand on how you square the circle of Brexit being both a challenge and an opportunity for Irish suppliers? Do you mean that um, when frictionless trade is, is ended between the UK, will it encourage Tesco UK to start focusing on smaller number of key suppliers from countries like Ireland? Could you focus on that? Yeah, and, and, and hopefully if I'm, I'm hear, hearing the, the question correctly, I think the, the opportunity is for Irish suppliers to continue to supply into the UK market. Reality is the UK market is the eighth largest market in the world. Therefore, we can't underestimate the importance of the UK market. And I think the level of preparation from Irish suppliers has been very good with regards to Brexit. 
and they have successfully navigated thus far. Um, our UK uh, business values the quality of Irish produce. And as I say, the ambition is to continue to, uh, to stock Irish produce in, 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 the, in the UK. So I think that's the key part with regards to the challenge and the opportunity from an export point of view. From an import point of view, I think, you know, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim referenced it earlier on, 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 on production nationalism or, or food nationalism. I think what you'll find is um, there is an opportunity for Irish suppliers to level the playing field a little bit because of the friction. And also the Irish grocery market is relatively small. Therefore, there is the opportunity um, for Irish suppliers to compete on a level footing, getting a little bit of a leg up, ironically, from, from Brexit. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Joe. Um, another question in, and I, I might uh, ask David to, just for his views on this. Um, it's around the, um, the the online shopping piece. Uh, are there big plans to address the infrastructural issues around online grocery shopping, and will there be an impact on prices to cover the high cost of delivery? I suppose just addressing that across the market. What are your views on that, uh, David? Yeah, I, I think the cost of online delivery had always been a limiting factor. Um, but I think people are now more more attuned to the benefits it can bring. So maybe they're they're more willing to, I don't know, foot some of that cost and and accept that yeah, actually receiving that delivery is is a real benefit to me. So it is something I'm prepared to pay more for. You know, I think for the retailers, it's about finding that right right model. Whether there's yeah, you know, the trial of things like subscription models and and to try and bring the cost down, but bring more certainty into it. So. Um, definitely, I think 2020 was more around right the response to that initial massive jump in demand for online grocery. And then I think 2021 and beyond will be about consolidating that, trying to find the right model uh, that the different retailers can work with. I think the infrastructure is keeps getting brought up, whether it's about food and drink groceries or whether it's about other other sectors as well I think that is a challenge and it's certainly something that I think there's a number of different parties that are willing to that are hoping to get that fixed and improved okay thank you David um just going to finish up on the questions and answers uh really a question for Jim really I mean Jim you've been around the block a few times on this now you've been with Love Irish Food right from the beginning you've seen the impact of the financial crisis um uh, the first time round, we're, we're heading now for, for, for major challenges between Brexit and COVID-19. Any lessons that, that you've seen coming through that you, you would like to impart really to, to, to food producers and maybe what, what we got right the first time around, what, what lessons can we learn in terms of moving forward this time and, and, and coming through at the other end? Well, I mean, that there is the obvious um, message around, sorry, lesson around messaging that David was talking about, you know, amplifying the, uh, the provenance of your product, et cetera, is really important. Um, I, I, I think that the those businesses that have done have, have thrived over the last decade are those that have provided good product, good customer service, uh, good marketing, all, all of those things, I suppose, that you need to build up any business. But um, making sure that you have an adequate supply satisfy the demand from the retail sector out there is really, really important. And the one thing you don't want to do is to go into your local retailer and find that the product you're looking for isn't on the shelves. So and uh, so stuff like that, making sure the supply chain to the retailer is as strong as possible. Uh, but it, it's and it's really stressing the provenance and it's really um, emphasizing the quality and safety, sustainability all of those attributes of domestically food produced here you know i think get just getting that message out there okay thank you thank you for that joe um we're, we're under pressure on time and we have run a little bit over so thank you all for staying with us um i'd like to finish up really by by thanking everybody who's taken part uh, today to thanks to the thonish for his his um his input to jim power and um, always very 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 interesting on on the whole economic picture that we're all uh, in, working within to david berry of kantar uh, for that insight into the how consumers are really thinking and to joe manning um uh, for his 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 
great presentation on, on Tesco and, and how we can all work together with Tesco to, to improve our, our businesses. So thanks to everybody for listening. Um, I hope you've got some insight into the challenges, the double challenges of COVID and Brexit for the Irish food industry and for Irish food brands. Um, if you want to know more about Love Irish Food, please visit the website at loveirishfood.com. Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to, to be with you here this morning and uh, we look forward to, I, I think this will be the beginning of, of more events for Love Irish Food online. Um, and also, can I thank Kieran Romley and Aidan and Porrick Smith and the team for putting the, the whole event together. So goodbye to everybody and, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>